The way we have presented exponential smoothing so far is based on the historical development of the subject, uh, where there were methods that were developed to provide forecasts relatively simply, but there was no idea of a statistical model underpinning them until the late 1990s. And that's when innovation states-based models were developed. Initially, beginning with uh, Ralph Snyder at Monash University, and then over the 10 years from 1997 through to about 2007, uh, all the theory was developed to help uh, provide the tools that we now use for exponential smoothing modeling. So the methods that we've shown so far, and we've called them methods rather than models, they're simply algorithms that will return a point forecast. And although we fitted them using the model function and we showed prediction intervals when we were looking at graphs, the equations we showed were, were actually just um, methods that generated point forecasts. We're now gonna talk about the models that actually uh, underpin them and which were used to show those prediction intervals. So a model is, is a stochastic uh, equation that includes some kind of random component. And we're gonna have two different models for every one of the methods that we've talked about. The two models will both generate the same point forecast, but could have quite different variances and therefore different forecast distributions. So when we talk about a model, we mean a stochastic uh, data generating process that can generate the whole forecast distribution. Um, and as well as being able to give you uh, the whole distribution, um, it also gives you tools for uh, model selection. So you can choose between the models which one is most appropriate for the data. So it really, the work that began in 1997 has really revolutionized this part of forecasting and, and given it, um, made it possible to do a lot more than was ever possible before that. So let's look at simple exponential smoothing to start with, way back the first method that was introduced in this chapter. And the form, we, we introduced a few different forms of it, but the one that we're gonna start with here is the component form where you have a equation for the forecast and you have one smoothing equation which shows how the level changes over time as each new observation arises. Now, the, the thing that we're gonna introduce next is we're gonna compute the forecast error and then let it have certain properties. So the forecast error is the difference between what you see and what you predicted you would see. So what you predicted you would see would be y t hat given t minus one. So using the data up until time t minus one, what would you see in the very next period? What you actually saw was y t. So the difference between them is y t minus y t hat, which, and y t hat in this case, if you substitute h equals one and take one off both t's, you end up with l t minus one as your forecast of the next period. So your forecast error which we'll call ET is YT minus LT minus one. And then we can therefore rewrite the first lot of equations in this other form, which is called the error correction form, where your observation YT is simply just rearrange, rearrange this equation to give this one. Your, y, your observation is the previous level plus an error. Your level, if we rearrange this equation, your level can be written um, like this um, in, in this form, which therefore can be written in this form. So we, it's just a bit of rearrangement, but it introduces the idea of the forecast error in the equation. And then we say, well, let's suppose the forecast error, ET, has a normal distribution uh, with constant variance, and which are independent from time to time. So that stands for normal and independently distributed uh, with mean zero and variant sigma squared. And to uh, sort of denote the fact that we're actually up, um, assuming a distribution here, we'll change the notation from E to epsilon. 
And that very simple step changes everything because then instead of having a equations that generate point forecasts, we now have equations that have stochastic properties. Um, and let's rewrite them again. So your yt is now lt minus one plus this stochastic error. And the lt is lt minus one plus alpha times that stochastic component epsilon. And once we have it in this form, we can then start deriving properties of that, like what is the forecast distribution or what is the likelihood of it. So this is called an innovations or a single source of error state space model because both equations have exactly the same process input. The epsilon here is the same in both equations, which makes it an unusual form of state space model. The first equation we call the measurement equation because it uh, shows how the states, in this case there's one state, LT, shows how the states are related to what you actually observe, the measure, which is YT. And then the state equation shows how the states evolve through time. In this case, there's only one state, so how the one state L evolves through time. We could have derived the things differently by making a different assumption about the errors. So suppose instead of assuming that the difference between what you predicted and what you saw was a normal uh, independently distributed error, Suppose instead we thought that the relative error had that property. So the relative error is the dis difference between what you saw and what you predicted you would see divided by what you predicted. So it's a proportion, proportional error compared to what was predicted. If we thought that that was normal and independent and mean zero and homoscedastic, then we derive a different model. So again, the point forecast, y t hat, is simply the previous level. And if we, we substitute this equation into here, um, we end up with y as a, as a function of l and epsilon like this one. And the difference between what you see and what you predicted you would see, y minus y hat, is now given by l t minus 1 times epsilon. We rearrange that a little bit and we end up with a measurement equation and a state equation that looks like, like what's in the grey box there. So we started with the same point forecasts, but we made a different assumption about what was the stochastic homoscedastic independent error. Is it the additive error, difference between what you predicted and what you saw, or is it a relative error, a proportional error? And we end up with, within the proportional case, we end up with this set of equations. In the additive case, we end up with the, the previous set. Both sets of equations will give the same point forecasts, assuming alpha is the same and L0 and B0 are the same. Assuming you've got the same, the same parameters, you will end up with the same point forecast, but you'll have different prediction intervals because you've got different properties of the errors. So this one we call ETS MNN for um, multiplicative error. So the ETS stands for exponential, um, sorry, stands for error trend seasonal, error trend seasonal. It also sort of evokes exponential smoothing. But the ETS gives you the order of what's in the parentheses. E for error corresponds to M multiplicative errors. The T corresponds to the second one and the S corresponds to the third one. So the, we have two models now. We have an ANN model and an MNN model, both of which underpin simple exponential smoothing. To fit these two, we simply change the error um, part of the model specification to be either an A or an M. The other parts are the same. And when it goes and fits the model, it'll optimally choose alpha and L0, um, and it'll choose it differently uh, depending on which of the two because it's going to be a different likelihood function. You can override the choice at least of alpha by specifying it inside the trend part of the model. You can give it a specific value like alpha equals 0.5 or you can give it a range saying choose something in this range and it'll choose the optimal value within that range. We can do the same sort of uh, 
rewriting of the models for any of the ones that we've looked at, the Holtz linear trend or the damped trend or the Holt-Winters models, uh, sorry, Holt-Winters methods. Um, so if we take the Holtz linear method with additive errors, we're assuming that the difference between what we saw and what we predicted we would see would be normal, independent, homoscedastic. And we plug that into the uh, error correction form of the equations, and we get um, this set of equations here. So notice that it's the same epsilon in all three lines, but with a different multiplier. And the multiplier for the last set for the slope is alpha times beta star. Now to make the writing down of these a little simpler, we're going to re-express that as beta. So remember, we said earlier that we wanted to use beta star because we were keeping beta for a later, a later model formulation. Well, here it is. So we're going to use beta instead of alpha times beta star. Um, the MAN model, multiplicative errors and additive trend and no seasonality is obtained when we assume that the relative error is, uh, is the stochastic independent error term. And again, plug it in, rearrange the equations, and we get this set of equations, which is for um, the multiplicative version of Holt's linear method. Um, and when we specify this model, uh, we just, exactly as before, we just change the first term, additive error or multiplicative error, and the trend and seasonal terms are what, exactly as we were doing before. And then uh, we can do it for the whole winters methods as well. Uh, so here we have plugged in the epsilon being the additive error, and we get this set of equations, and we've got a um, an alpha and a beta and a gamma uh, as the multipliers for the different states. And uh, yeah, we can go ahead and use this model now to generate prediction intervals. And then here's the multiplicative error model with multiplicative seasonality, which is quite a common combination that, that gets used. And this, uh, again, derived in exactly the same way as we showed earlier, but this time with the multiplicative errors being plugged into the equations with multiplicative seasonality. And uh, again, all you have to do is to change the uh, error part of the model specification and everything should work okay. By default, uh, it will then go ahead and, op and estimate all the parameters, um, optimal values for the gamma and all of the seasonal components. And if you've got trend, optimal values for beta and B0 and optimal values for alpha and L0. Um, and as for the others, you can override the optimal choices if you choose. So we end up with these set of models now. Instead of the the yeah, we had nine models when we had three types of trend and three types of seasonality. When you then multiply up by the two types of error, we now have 18 models, two times three times three. Um, and you can write them out in a set of two tables like this. It turns out that some of these models are not actually particularly useful. Uh, they, they're, they're numerically unstable and so some of these models we're not going to use. Uh, in particular, we're not going to use models that have um, certain combinations of multiplicative, um, some multiplicative and some additive components. Uh, we'll, we'll come to that. Um, so here are the all of the additive error models. Um, and again, as, as when we were looking at that, the methods, Studying this set of equations, you'll start seeing patterns and start to understand how it all works. And here are the um, multiplicative error versions of those models. Okay, so that's the set of uh, innovation state space models that we're going to be using. Um, and we'll now be able to do things like derive prediction intervals and uh, write down the likelihood. And once we write down the likelihood, we can do things like use 
ACA ECU's information criterion to uh, to choose the best model amongst all the models. So that provides being able to write the models down like this provides us with a lot of extra tools, which we're going to now be able to use in the subsequent sections of this chapter.